Welcome back to Lifetime Talks, everyone. I'm Jamie Martin. And I'm David Freeman. And we have a fan favorite guest back today. We have our friend Samantha McKinney with yes. us today, and she has been here before talking about gut health and metabolism and answering lots of questions about health and nutrition. Today we're talking about blood sugar control. Mm. Before we get into that, a little bit about Sam. Sam is a registered dietitian, trainer, and manager of digital Lifetime Nutrition Programs, content, and coaching. Since starting with Lifetime in 2011, she's served in various roles supporting member nutrition and fitness programming, and is known for her passion and expertise in wellness and metabolism. When she's not working, she's focused on expanding her knowledge. She's a big fan of learning. We just discussed this, <laughs> and understanding in the understanding of human health, staying active. And and spending quality time with her husband and son. Sam, thanks for coming back. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome, thanks welcome. for having me. Hey, how are you? Uh, great, I'm happy to be here. It's a very cold day in Minnesota today, but we made it. <laughs> <laughs> we always, we, could, we find a way yes. when we're here, right? All right, so we're gonna jump right into today's topic of blood sugar balance and control. I know you get a ton of questions about this oh, yeah. coming through the programming that you're coaching through. Just let's start by level setting about what blood sugar is and why it matters for health. Oh gosh, this is, I feel like I say this about every topic, but this really is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> so when we talk about blood sugar, in other words, blood glucose, it's the same thing. That's basically a really simple way of saying the actual level of sugar in your bloodstream, which obviously sounds a little bit um, obvious, but oftentimes when people hear blood sugar, they usually just associate that with, oh, how much sugar I eat. Do I eat dessert? And really it's way more complex and all encompassing than that. Um, it impacts nearly every facet of your health. A lot of things can throw off your blood sugar. Um, and there's also a lot that you can do to control it. And there's usually a lot of symptoms and chronic health conditions that people are struggling with that they don't even realize go back to what their blood sugar levels chronically are. So huge topic oh, to unpack. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So when we think of just its functional role, what it what it does for us day to day, what would you consider like optimal for us to make sure that we're in optimal ranges when it comes to blood sugar levels? Yeah. So um, your body has a really complex web of sim systems to keep it in a pretty narrow range. So mm -hmm. generally speaking, it's going to run somewhere between like 80 ish mm -hmm. fasting. And this is optimally speaking up to around like 110 or so after meals and so it should ideally stay in that range now there's obviously huge variation there there are certain conditions such as type 1 diabetes mm -hmm. which is um, basically a, an, an autoimmune condition that does not allow you to control blood sugar you are reliant on external um, insulin and medication for that but if it goes too high or too low that's life-threatening I don't really think that's going to be the, necessarily the focus of this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's more about, hey, if it's a little bit too high or a little bit too low, not quite in diagnostic ranges, what are some right. practical um, implications to your yeah. health for that? And then what can what can you do about it? Awesome. Absolutely. So that's shocking optimally, but we mm -hmm. know that a good portion of Americans do not have their blood sugar in control. Can you speak mm -hmm. a little bit to the stats and how did we get here? Yes. Okay. So about one in three. So... I don't know. There's three of us at this table. Who is right. it, right? <laughs> about, one? <laughs> about one in three U.S. adults have impaired blood sugar control. One out of ten have full-blown diabetes, which again, everything on disease or everything with, um, you know, blood sugars on a spectrum. Sure. And there's health on one side, and there's disease on the other. And mm -hmm. the full-blown diabetes, um, specifically type two, which is more related to lifestyle, typically more controllable, is kind of the full-blown piece of that. The scary part is, is that most people are unaware that they have blood sugar issues until sometimes they get diagnosed with diabetes and they've been on this path for months, years, or even decades that they could have made changes had yeah. they known, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the stats there um, can get pretty pretty uh, scary and staggering, but there again, there's this undertone of there's a lot we can do. And to your question of how did we get here, also multifactorial. So it has to do with um, our food supply, how we've been eating, whether or not we're active, and our overall stress levels too. Right. So it's this perfect storm of um, a lot of people struggling with chronically high or really varying blood blood sugars. I just want to clarify something real quick because you mentioned type 1 diabetes earlier. We're yeah. talking specifically when these factors with type 2 diabetes, correct? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways that your blood sugar can be off. So type 1 diabetes is a little bit in its own category um, and that needs to be medically managed, it, you know, in, in most cases. So that I feel like we could set aside because it's less controllable, you know, with nutrition lifestyle factors. Mm -hmm. The I think the 
uh, imbalances that we can focus on fall into a few categories, right? So the first one is we talked about those steady blood sugar levels. Some people start to struggle with um, like low, like hypoglycemic. You might have heard that word before. Mm -hmm. That means your blood sugar is going low um, episodes. And that actually is not great for your health either. And kind of the classic way of identifying that is if you go too long without eating, if you get what I call hangry, you know, Mm -hmm. hungry and angry at the same time, or you get irritable or shaky in between meals. That's not a good thing. Um, That actually causes an immense amount of stress on your body. Every time your blood sugar dips too low, your stress hormones surge. Mm -hmm. Not a good thing. Um, Actually, part of the reason that people with blood sugar issues don't sleep well overnight because they're having blood sugar lows and it's surging cortisol and epinephrine, which is making them toss and turn. Um, The next um, category is what we call prediabetes, and that's sort of, I'd say, the most... um, that's really the time to take action. So it's whenever your blood sugar levels are starting to get chronically high, but mm-hmm. they're not at a place where most physicians are going to be super concerned yet, but you're starting to notice symptoms that you might be normalizing, mm. such as trouble sleeping, cravings, belly fat, energy level ups and downs, et cetera. Um, and then it goes into kind of full-blown diabetes, which a lot of people can actually put themselves in remission there too. Not a guarantee, right. but a lot you can do little G.I. Joe reference here, you know, knowing is half the battle. And if you actually are aware, I know you just mentioned a few of those symptoms. Is it, is it other ways from a testing standpoint or how regularly we should be tested to make sure we can be proactive in this space? Yes. Um, I love that question. So thanks for bringing that up. I would actually say one of the biggest things that I love people to take away from this conversation is you should know your blood sugars. Like mm-hmm. you need to know your testing. So fasting blood glucose, um, that's a great thing to test regularly, but it can be thrown off by a lot of things. So for for example, if you have a poor night's sleep, mm. your fasting blood sugar is probably going to be a little bit higher. If you're stressed out, your fasting blood sugar is going to be higher. So knowing your fasting glucose trend every couple of months over time mm. would be ideal if you're looking at fasting glucose. Um, some people um, actually use continuous glucose monitors, so CGMs. Those are becoming um, more popular in the general um, population, even for people that don't have diabetes, right. to sort of see how foods are impacting their blood sugar. Um, hemoglobin A1C is probably one of the best things to track. So what that marker is looking at, you ideally want it to be under 5.3. A lot of traditional medical reference ranges go up to 5.7 or so. Um, Mm -hmm. What that's looking at, is measured in percentages, is what's your average blood sugar been over the last three months? So um, the other term for that is called glycosylated hemoglobin. So one of the problems with higher blood sugar is when you have higher levels of glucose in your blood, And I'm going to kind of say this a little bit simply. This isn't like, this is directionally accurate, not fully physiologically Mm -hmm. accurate. But think of it as like there are, it's sticky in your blood and it starts to kind of abnormally stick to proteins. Mm -hmm. And so um, it will stick to hemoglobin. So glycosylated hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C just means hemoglobin that has the sugar stuck to it. Um, But that's not the only compound that sugar sticks to. It'll stick to other proteins, and that's part of the reason that it ages you faster Mm. inside out when you have higher blood sugar. Um, Another one to look at is triglycerides. So that one is run in almost every standard physical. It's part of a lipid panel when your doctor's looking at your heart health. Um, And we ideally want those under 100, but it's not usually a concern until it's over 150. So it's like a 50% increase from what's optimal, right, before we're getting talked to about it. Um, And then if you can get a doctor to run or if you want to do direct-to-consumer lab testing and check your insulin levels, um, sometimes the units or the um, levels of insulin medically go up to 25, but you actually want to keep them under 8. Some people say under 5. Okay. Oh, yes. well, yeah. I mean, I want to make sure yes. all the listeners were able to digest that, <laughs> right? Because right? it was a, it was a good, great amount of like, content there. So I want to write down and want everybody else who's listening right now or watching to write down the top three ways to go get checked. So one, two, three. Let's I see would it. say hemoglobin A1C, mm-hmm. probably one of the most accessible ones. Um, I would say triglycerides mm-hmm. is another one. Um, And then the last one, oh gosh, it would be a toss. If you can get insulin drawn, fasting insulin, I would do that one. If you can't do that, then I would just um, figure out a way to, on a pretty regular basis, check your trend of fasting sugar. So I cheated there. That was four instead of three. I like it. Yeah. (laughs) It's a bonus. It's a bonus. I like that. Bonus one. Look at us saying the same thing. We're on the same page. Okay. You mentioned the continuous glucose monitors. And I want to talk a little bit about that because it seems that that's becoming a more direct-to-consumer product. 
How accurate are those? Do we know yet? Or is it still up in the air? And is it right for everybody to use that? Or is it better to work with your doctor? Yeah. Um, so what's funny is that I've been on the podcast before. You guys know that my answer is often. <laughs> it depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah. So the accuracy is obviously going to um, be pending, you know, the company and the manufacturer and everything. Um you know, for some people, if you are stressed out super easily, um, you might it might not be the best approach for you, right? Some people are kind of analysis by paralysis with data, and other people actually see strong behavior change with data. I'm pro knowing whenever you can, as long as you feel empowered and you know what to do if, if things are off. Um, a little anecdote, actually, I have a coworker right now. Um, he's not a registered dietitian, but he's playing around with using a CGM, and it's been really interesting to hear his experience so far. Um, what I do like about them is there are some general things that you can do to manage blood sugar, like foods to focus on or foods to avoid. But there really is variation from person to person. Like one person might um, be able to eat a bowl of oatmeal or some chickpeas Mm -hmm. and process that fine, while another one that might really spike blood sugar a lot. So for example, this particular um, colleague, he um, white potatoes, even if it's mixed in with a meal with protein and fat, spike his blood sugar higher than a pint of ice cream. Ooh. Wow. But he wouldn't have known that otherwise. Right. Now, I'm not advocating going to eat a pint of ice cream, <laughs> right. you know, but it's interesting. And he's even said, just by, you know, monitoring this, he's like, I've always known, because he's a trainer, he's like, I've known that blood sugar is tied to cognition and even like mental health and focus. He goes, it's mind blowing experiencing it on my own. Now that I know what foods spike my blood sugar, and this is verbatim, Mm -hmm. he's like, it is unbelievable how much mental focus I have now that my blood sugar levels are stable, which is really cool to hear. That is cool. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. So I mean, that's that's more from the nutrition perspective. Now, if we were to say, I wanna be able to manage the blood glucose levels from uh, training or let me say management of stress, sleep, what are certain things that we can do in that space? Well, let's actually talk a little bit about exercise because that's one of the most mm-hmm. underutilized ways of bringing blood sugar into balance. Um, strength training, especially for the people that are prioritizing blood sugar, which should be everybody, um, mm-hmm. or anybody that has confirmed symptoms or confirmed labs, strength training is like the best kept secret for controlling mm-hmm. blood sugar. So mm-hmm. there's this whole process of what starts to happen whenever your body's blood sugar is chronically high. One of the hormones that brings blood sugar down is insulin. Mm -hmm. Most people don't think to themselves, well, where does it go? Right. Right. Where does the blood sugar go? It goes into your liver, into your muscles and into your fat stores, right? Whenever insulin is released. What happens is as blood sugar is high and I'm circling back to exercise here, Mm -hmm. if you're wondering, I'm going (laughs) off on the tangent here. Um, When it comes to insulin, so your body's secreting insulin, trying to get blood sugar levels down, the insulin receptors on your cells that actually where the insulin attaches that help bring the blood sugar into the cells and and lower it, they start to become resistant. So it's almost like they're getting, it's almost like a, you know, a a neighbor knocking on your door over and over and over, eventually start ignoring it. That's what your insulin receptors start doing. Mm -hmm. It's getting flooded with insulin too much. The beauty of strength training is that even if you're starting to get insulin resistant, which is a progression through prediabetes and eventually diabetes, um, when you strength train, it's like there's this alternate door on mm-hmm. your cells. It's mm-hmm. called a GLUT4 transporter, and it opens up, and it will lower your blood sugars, even if you're insulin resistant, wow, which cool. is awesome. Um, there are even mouse studies that say that, and granted, we're not mice, but this is, uh, I would I would believe, directionally accurate. Um, there are mouse studies that show after just implementing two weeks of exercise will start to lower your blood wow. sugar. So it happens mm-hmm. relatively quickly, mm-hmm. and it's that movement is so important. And right. um Actually, I'm going to give one more anecdote, too. Mm-hmm. So um, gestational diabetes, that's usually, in a lot of cases, it's complex. But for most people, that goes back to pre-existing blood sugar issues mm-hmm. that sort of first get caught in pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So for me personally, um, I um, I failed my gestational diabetes the first screen, mm-hmm. which there are limitations to that test. And so instead of doing the second one, what I opted to do is I said to my doctor, isn't the main thing to see what my blood sugars are doing? He agreed, yes. I said, let me just monitor my my blood sugar, kind of fasting and after each meal so we can see. I was convinced, ended up being right. I did not have gestational diabetes personally, but I was tracking it. And what was so interesting for me, I pretty much could eat whatever I wanted without my blood sugar going over that 110 after meals. Mm 
Um, the only time it spiked was whenever I went on a summer road trip and was sitting in sedentary mm. for seven hours in the car. Oh, and I wasn't eating poorly in the car. Right. It literally right. was just because I was sedentary. Mm. So whenever you go back to movement, yeah. crucial. Mm. Right. Okay, so we've got the movement, and then we also need to recover. And that's what happens when we're sleeping. Our bodies work really hard mm. when we're in bed and we're mm-hmm. getting some shut eyes. So let's talk about that. Yes. Um, in terms of how your sleep mm-hmm. impacts your or, or both? Both, I think. Well, how does it impact, okay. you know, our system? So I'll say kind of what I mentioned earlier is when your blood sugar is spiking up and down, whenever it has those overnight lows, that's when you're going to toss and turn. Right. So it's kind of a downward spiral because then if you're waking up a lot at night, that causes stress on your system mm-hmm. and that will raise your morning blood sugar. So right. sleep and blood sugar control are just intricately connected. You can't really unwind them. And in fact... Um, if let's say Jamie and I, let's say we eat the same exact nutrition, had the same exact exercise. If you were sleeping eight hours a night and I was sleeping six hours a night, my fasting blood sugars are more likely going to be higher and look right. pre-diabetic, whereas yours might not. Right. So prioritizing sleep is huge. I'm going to throw a wrench in there. Can I throw a wrench in there? Please. No, throw like a wrench. Caffeine. Hmm. Dependency on caffeine, how your body responds to it, does it have any kind of correlation to blood sugar levels? It might. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not usually the first thing. Like caffeine intake isn't usually the first thing I would address with a client with okay. blood sugar issues. The only caveat to that is if somebody has adrenal issues, mm-hmm. um, you have trouble regulating blood sugar for sure. Your adrenal glands and your blood sugar, those are like BFFs, right? Mm-hmm. So if you are overdoing it with caffeine and you yeah. have pre-existing adrenal issues and it's worsening those, your blood sugar is going to be really hard to control. So mm-hmm. in that scenario, probably, yeah. but generally speaking, it's not usually the first thing that I address. Okay. But um, I'm going to throw a wrench in, too. Go for it. I think it might also be helpful for the listeners, if you guys are okay with it, of going into, like, other things affected by right. blood sugar, too, unless that's a little bit later in the conversation. Let's, no, let's go for it. Let's go for it now. Um, so part of the reason that all of this is so important, I mentioned cognition and focus, but your underlying – your chronic blood sugar levels are tied to, like I said, almost every facet of health. So heart disease is the number one killer mm-hmm. tied to heart disease, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. Hands down, if you have lipid issues, you need to be controlling your blood sugar. If your blood sugar is high, you naturally retain sodium. That will increase your blood pressure. So right. think about how many people have blood pressure issues, right? Mm-hmm. And everybody's concerned about sodium and foods. Okay, fine. Sodium in foods for most people is not as much of a concern as the sodium you're retaining from higher levels of insulin due to high blood sugar, right? Mm. So that's another one. Um, People are always concerned about hormones. I think I've been on here talking about thyroid health. Um, It could be PMS. It could be menopausal hormones. For men, it could be testosterone levels. Um, For men, also erectile dysfunction. Mm. All of that goes back to blood sugar. It, it, It really, truly does. So... Out of whack blood sugars will stress out your system, which will throw off your thyroid. Your hormones, your sex hormones in particular, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, have zero chance, zero chance of being balanced when your sugars are off. And so I'll even just give this as an example. Sometimes when men, they have low testosterone, they're like, okay, I just need to go on testosterone therapy. Testosterone replacement has a time and place, but testosterone can be converted to estrogen. Mm -hmm. The enzyme that does that, aromatase, can increase when your blood sugars are high. So think about this. You have a male who's maybe not sleeping, not exercising, has low testosterone, feels like trash. If he just, assuming he has higher blood sugar levels, he just goes on testosterone, his body's going to be raising his estrogen. So again, this is, you know, the... So intertwined, all of it. It's just this web. Yes. And so for members that do lifetime lab testing, usually they're doing it because they feel stuck or they're really achy or um, they feel like their thyroid's off or they're just worried about something with their metabolism. Mm -hmm. And yes, usually they're right. Their thyroid is off or their hormones are off or their blood lipids and their cholesterol are off. But I hone in on that sugar because those will not regulate until you regulate your blood sugar. And doing that is right. relatively straightforward for most people. It doesn't mean it's easy, it's straightforward though. Right, but again, it goes back to, there's a lot of foundational lifestyle habits that can influence that and that we do have level of control over. Absolutely, yes. So walk us through, I mean, you just yeah. said it, like lab testing from lifetime, for mm-hmm. example. So now, what would be the suggested test? Uh, is it a full panel? What would you suggest as far as from your expertise, this is what you should do, and then we give you this course of action based off the results? Yeah, so 
depends, right? <laughs> so part of it, if somebody's having like low blood sugar issues, yeah. for example, right, that, that, that can be an issue. Um, it's going to have a little bit of a different strategy than people that have like cr- kind of chronically high. Like low blood sugar, for example, that's somebody where I'd be like, hey, I know it's popular, but you might not want to intermittent fast right now, mm-hmm. right? Um, for somebody whose blood sugars are a little bit higher, there's a couple of foundational things that we need to address first. Number one, what is your protein and your fat intake? Because right. food pairings do matter for what your blood sugar does after a meal, right? Mm-hmm. So right. I'll, I'll use oatmeal as an example. You could eat oatmeal. If you have oatmeal with eggs, for example, that protein and fat, it's probably not going to spike and drop quite as much. Right. You sort of want this like even um, even blood sugar throughout the day. And if you right. have carbs or sugar by itself, it'll spike. Um, strength training is another one. Mm-hmm. Um, omega-3 fatty acids can be super helpful. So people that choose to supplement with fish oil, it can help with um, your triglycerides. It can help with your hemoglobin A1C. Now, again, alone, yeah. I, I would right. suggest this in context with other things. Your vitamin D status, which most people not supplementing are low, and your right. magnesium status are really intricately related to how well your body can manage these blood sugars. So those are kind of like table stakes. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of people, I do recommend um, a lower carb, borderish ketogenic approach temporarily Mm -hmm. this is not like medical grade therapeutic keto but two to six weeks or so until their bodies start becoming a little bit more insulin sensitive Mm -hmm. can potentially be helpful too so if they're right now i'm going to a lifetime site and i'm looking at panels or labs which one would you say is going to cover all the things you just talked about? well for people that do Direct to consumer lab testing, I always defer to our all encompassing, okay. all in one panel to start as an annual. This isn't something that you have to do all the time, but just an annual check of everything. Okay. Because, yeah, your blood sugar matters, but guess what? Some of the things it's impacting, like your lipids or your cortisol or your hormones, if those are off enough, you might need to be addressing those in tandem with your blood right. sugar. Mm-hmm. So I don't like looking at things in a silo. Right. Um, but some of the markers that we talked about at the beginning of this episode, I would recommend that you just keep tabs on all the time. And you should be able to get those done at your doctor, I would hope. Right. Okay. Ask for them. No, kind of go with a list probably with what you want to yes. address in any given appointment. Yes. That makes sense. One other factor that I want to address because it is something we can do is stress management because we know that a lot of people are stressed out mm-hmm. and then chronic cortisol and all these other pieces. So talk to us a little bit about stress. Okay. So if we go back a little bit and think about how your body responds to stress. So um, for those listeners that are familiar with adrenal issues, Mm -hmm. um, you kind of already have a baseline, but I'll give a quick overview. You know, your main stress hormone is called cortisol, right? And cortisol is not all bad. Sometimes we call it bad, but it basically follows a pattern throughout the day where it's a little bit higher in the morning, dips off by noon and trails off in the evening. And it's just sort of supposed to oscillate like that every day. Well, If you think about stressors that we are biologically like programmed to respond to, they're not the type of stressors we're dealing with today. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a work deadline or traffic, the type of stressors we're biologically programmed to respond to are like, hey, there's a tiger or a bear chasing Mm -hmm. me. What do you think your body needs if a tiger's chasing you? Adrenaline. Yep, adrenaline, Mm -hmm. and you need the energy from sugar. Mm -hmm. So even if you're eating perfectly, this is what I want to like emphasize. Let's say you're eating perfectly. You're eating like good protein, good fiber, lots of veggies, healthy fats, all that type of stuff. Your carbohydrates are appropriate for your activity level. There's a process called gluconeogenesis. That means genesis of new glucose Mm -hmm. that your body will do under stress. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is it literally forms glucose out of your liver to give you the sugar that mm. it perceives you need to run away from the tiger. To mm. escape and survive. But you're usually sitting in your office looking at your computer during this stress. So all it's doing is raising your blood sugar and you're not burning it off. Right. Mm. So all of it, and those that are really kind of type A, high stress personality, sometimes they'll get really frustrated because they're like, I'm doing all of these things. I'm doing all these things and my blood sugar is still running high. I'm like, you're not managing your stress and your body is doing exactly what it should be doing under stress. The problem is, is that for you, it's chronic and you're not burning off the sugar that, that it's giving you. So, um, the stress management piece is huge. And that's where I had mentioned that cortisol and blood sugar are BFFs and it works the opposite way too. So if you're super stressed out, your cortisol goes up. Your body's like, oh my gosh, something's going on. I, I need to give. I need to give you energy. So here's here's some sugar, here's right? Sugar. Mm-hmm. Well, the opposite, the other other end of the spectrum happens too, where if your um, your blood sugar dips down. So let's say maybe you ate a meal that wasn't balanced. You just grabbed maybe a high sugar granola bar. It wasn't really balanced with protein or fat. Your blood sugar spikes. What goes up must come down. Mm-hmm. It drops too low. So maybe below that 80 or so, your body's like 
oh my goodness, my priority right now is getting blood sugar levels back up to that narrow range that we had kicked off with yeah. in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And it'll shoot out cortisol. So you just end up on this giant roller coaster, roller coaster with these erratic ups and downs. downs. It's so interesting. We did an article in the magazine. It was called Complete the Stress Cycle. And part mm -hmm. of that was movement as a way. Because if we're not moving, so mm -hmm. how do we... It goes back to all of this is connected again. Yes. Movement, nutrition, all of these pieces are working together. Well, Our think, lifestyle. Think about your environment too, right? right? So if you think about the world that we live in, you need to purpose... You need. What I always say is you need to manage your blood sugar on purpose, right? right. So think of this scenario... You don't have a good night's sleep. You wake up, you don't realize that your blood sugar is, you know, higher just because your sleep isn't isn't good. Right. Um, you're rushing out the door. You grab a banana. Banana, it's a healthy food, but alone is not a meal. You mm -hmm. eat that. It spikes your blood sugar, and then it drops. You feel a little, little bit irritable. You're running late for work, yeah. right? So you're at work. You're a little bit stressed out. Your blood sugar's going up again, right? You grab whatever's easy. You grab some coffee. You grab some caffeine. Mm -hmm. Stresses out your system more. And you kind of think about this. And as it's going up and down, you're dealing with the energy ups and downs. You're dealing with the cravings. And what's readily accessible? It's not usually foods that are really whole foods that are well balanced. And this is where it goes back to planning, prioritizing your yeah. workouts, making sure that you have a really well-balanced snack and meal planned on kind of a regular basis there. Yeah. I, I just want to go off that, and then we're going to go straight into the hot seat, yeah? You ready? No, I am ready, but I want to make sure. Have anything else to add, right? Yeah, yeah, but before, yeah. you just said it, like the people will go to a banana. Mm -hmm. If you can, we just want to throw those hacks out there. We want to make sure they can apply a lot of things. I know it can, it depends. Yes. But if you were to say <laughs> first thing in the morning, what was probably a good go-to if you are on the run and, and you need something quick? Yeah, so what's interesting is in the morning is whenever your cortisol should be naturally higher. Mm -hmm. That's actually ideally where you... Again, generally speaking, there right. are exceptions to this, um, where you should eat a little bit lower in carbo. You should eat lower carbohydrate foods. So if you could think to yourself, think a veggie omelet, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if you're running late, I personally do a protein shake just because it's okay. easy and it's fast. You yeah. know, just something fast like that, right. a little bit higher protein. Um, higher fat for those that tolerate dairy like a full fat organic greek yogurt with a couple berries on there mm. might, might be a great option um that would probably be the first thing okay. that i would grab and then eating you know a regular lunch and then a regular dinner mm -hmm. um and dinner time when your cortisol is a little bit lower most people are shocked because they want to burn carbs throughout the day which is why they eat them earlier actually throwing in a little bit and again generally speaking of starchy carbohydrates so think like roasted sweet potato or something in with your evening dinner can be helpful mm. overall. So it can actually help your sleep and help your melatonin and serotonin and all awesome. of that. And we have lots of content at experiencelife.lifetime.life that you've written, Sam, that we'll also link to this because there's great tips and great suggestions like that as well. Sure. So it's really accessible for people. Yes. Anything else you want to add? Any final note before <laughs> you get asked David's questions? The one other thing that I want to say is that increasing lean body mass and muscle is like, the antidote to poor blood sugar control. Mm -hmm. So no matter what your goals are, if they're performance, if they're weight loss, whatever they are, you should prioritize building and maintaining lean muscle. That's absolutely crucial. As we get older, we're naturally at risk for losing it. And so do every when it comes to blood sugar control, control do everything that you possibly can yep. to prioritize your lean muscle. It will be an absolute game changer. So that's kind of the one other thing that I wanted to note because again, as the decades go on and all of us are older right. today than we were yesterday, mm -hmm. um, it, it's so, so important to make sure that you strength train, eat your protein, build your muscle. Love it. All right, all right Sam, you've been through this before. Yes, you let's know do this it. drill. You got this. You got this all day. How would you define healthy? I would say um, you're able to do physically the things that you want to do. Um, your lab markers are within optimal ranges um, and that you have the energy and vitality and just overall happiness mm. inside and out to really be your absolute best self and show up every day. I like that happiness. Oh, that stood out to me. Happiness. Mm -hmm. All right. Would you rather skydive or bungee jump? I've actually been skydiving, so oh, skydive. Skydive in. Mm -hmm. All right. If your life was a movie, what character would you want to be? The main one. Oh, that <laughs> she was good. She was on it. I like that. I like, I like yeah. that. Well, if my life was a movie, mm -hmm. wouldn't I have to be the main you character? You are the main character, yeah. but if you had to have somebody, let me say, if somebody had to play you. Oh, I, huh. I just threw that in there, actually. Okay, you just made that up yep. right now. On the spot. Um, hmm. I don't know. Tina Fey, she's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Yeah, that was like good. It. All right. What do you consider your greatest personality trait? 
I'm um, detail oriented in every possible way. I'm very thorough. Oh, yeah. Do you remember back to Danny King's episode? It was like if he had a superlative, it would end up being uh, most informative. Yes. So, oh, there so you go. Yes. I yeah. like that. I like that. Okay. Last one. How do you want to leave, or what do you want to leave as a stamp of impact in the year 2022? Oh, I love these types of questions. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say stamp of impact would be empowering people to genuinely take control of their health. Um, Especially in recent years, I think there is a lot of fear and a lot of stress. And I just want people to feel like the choices you make matter Mm -hmm. and they impact outcomes. And so what you can control, you should. I love that. I love it. All right, Sam, thank you for another great episode. We're so glad you were here. Thanks for having me. I'll come back anytime. Love it. Thanks, Sam. 